space for grace, the fullness of faith and holiness of wholeness. With my Buddhist background, I find it curious that there's an increasing emphasis on mindfulness. It's often described as an intentional awareness of surrounding self and others. But I wonder if we're intentionally aware of the place of human beings. Do we increase our awareness by including words about people and their place? Perhaps we should with an acknowledgement of country. This is God's land. Many have gone before who have honoured God by caring for the land in the ways they have lived and shared and in the stories they have shared. We give thanks for the first peoples who have held as sacred the duty of protecting the land and living in harmony with it. May God honour and bless them now and to eternity. Indeed, if we regard the land as sacred and acknowledge a special relationship between the first peoples and the land God placed them on, perhaps we read the revelations of God in sky, sea and scripture with a refreshed sense of the mysteries of God. If we hear Psalm 19 or Colossians 1 in the voices of first people, perhaps we can step back from colonial interpretations of justified dominion and domination, instead remembering the context of people dispossessed of their relationships with one another and creation who long for the liberation to claim home sovereign. Could such a dream of sovereignty offer a taste of the kingdom of heaven? I wonder. If on this land those of us who are second people sought to learn from the heritage of 60,000 years of interactions between land and people, what might change? Perhaps as second people we might tend to our awareness not only of first peoples but also of one another. Perhaps we might recognise and learn to value the blessing of Pentecost's diversity, where the Spirit enables people to proclaim and hear and understand in many languages and cultures, rather than privileging a dominant language that requires assimilation and loss of identity and connection with land. In that creative moment of complex understandings, the Spirit makes clear that it's not part of God's plan that any one language shall have dominion over others. Rather, the foretaste of heaven is found in new understandings arising from crossing cultures and embracing difference. Might we welcome and celebrate such exchange? Might we offer sacrifices of praise as part of our covenant with God and First Peoples, bringing into exchange the graces that we could gift from across the seas. The moon crosses sky and the waters respond. It is time to move to the rhythm of heaven. The pull of the depths call to the shore. Turn to the longing deep in your soul. We look back to former ways in confession before turning our hearts in repentance. As we set our sails to the new tide, we set ourselves towards the promise of pilgrims. Perhaps together, we might reclaim a holy identity for humanity, not as individual human beings choosing our own paths and setting the many pillaging agendas for the earth, but claiming the place prepared for us within God's created order. A place of honour and delight as we experience the true realm of God as the children of God. Could we see ourselves as co-creators learning the imagination of God? Might we find ourselves beating swords into plowshares? Might human peacemaking between peoples lead to shared goals of restoring relationships with the rest of creation? In the age of the Anthropocene, we are indeed becoming aware that God's creation has been reshaped by humanity. At some place, the commencement of this age, Anthropocene, with dating from the Trinity, the name given to the first test of a nuclear weapon. Such dehumanising of ourselves and one another has led to the diminishment of creation. Yet reading the story of the incarnation of Jesus Christ promises to us that salvation has come within reach of our hands. In God's embodiment into creation as Emmanuel, God with us, we discover a new purpose for humanity, not as destroyer of creation, but as restorer. 
holy people could find themselves tending to the healing and wholeness of creation as gardeners, being sanctified by their engagement with wholeness, being inspired by the glimpses of heaven's reveal. We could, however, proclaim the message that heaven's version of earth is worth striving for. And this aim is in fact a KPI of the mission of God. If church is breathed into being by the Spirit so the mission of God may be served, we can expect the Spirit to require of us that church is organised and oriented to bless God in the way in which we tend to God's creation. Such orientation must see us leading the way rather than following reluctantly when it comes to adopting practices that demonstrate our faith in the generator of life. This could see every school, church, manse, hospital and aged care residents turning green as a missional imperative. Would we begin to recognise that delaying such action represents our ongoing corporate sin? Perhaps you didn't expect eternal burn sermon from me, but within this body beats the heart of a grandma. When we consider the question of faithful life, we do so in the face of death. How many species face extinction? How many grandchildren will live? I believe in the promise of God to the children of Abraham. There is a place where the potential of heaven will be revealed and experienced. It is up to, to us to follow the path of God revealed in the way of Christ by restoration of relationships with God, one another and self. By turning from greed and the habits of taking from the earth, we can learn the way of grace and true harmony the shalom Jesus breathed upon the world. To live faithfully, we must live as if we believe there can be a future for those who are and those yet to be. A future where heaven continues to be revealed rather than being a myth of memory. We must treat our home as a space and place for the grace of God to be revealed and enjoyed. We must tend to this place as the temple of God's own hand the great testimony to holy wonder. To the Creator be all glory, now and always. Amen.